introduce Derek Ferguson, who is a VSB senior, served as co-chair of VSB's inaugural VSB Week, and also co-president of Business Without Borders. Um, uh, Derek, I'd like to call you to introduce our guest speaker. <laughs> Good evening. John is best known as the creator and publisher of the best-selling Four Dummies brand of how to of how to books that has gone to sell over 200 million copies over 30 in over 30 languages. He was a founding me member of this Silicon Valley startup, which he successfully took public on Nasdaq and later sold. He is also the former president and publisher of two enter entertainment brands. He's not going to read all that hard. <laughs> and branding that uh, timing is everything and there's a defining moment in the life of every brand. So here I stand, the only person between you and a pint or a, a shot of the queer little fella, my I would say, and March Madness, and thank God Phil Moe is not playing tonight. So I'm really worried about that. And I think there's a ticket party as well. Is that possible? Huh? What a great concept. So thank you and welcome. I'm really shocked. By the way, I don't bite. So unless you have to use seven, I know there's two people living at seven. It's like church. You can sit in the front pew. It's like school. It's okay. Calm down. There you go. How about that? Now you can't sneak out. Right. Celtic fan too. Look at that. So my first uh, experience with Villanova was 1985. I was in Lexington, Kentucky, at the Bond Four, and my brother's coach and assistant at Notre Dame. They got knocked out. So he says, "Come on, let's go down." And what an amazing experience to see that. Does anyone remember that? Was anyone there? You were there or you remember? I was, I vote. Oh! What kind of trick I don't know. No trick questions. So, an amazing brand, and my experience there was sitting around watching like this underdog team, right? This underdog school, the smallest school. There was three Big East teams, and that was state, right? St. John's, Chris Mullen, Walter Berry gets knocked out, uh, Georgetown, right? Who do they have? A couple of big giants. And uh, here's Villanova, you know, amazing. And, and what I'm here to say is, as an immigrant son, I'm an Irish citizen, um, passport carrying, proud of my parents with uh, Ireland, and uh, born, raised, educated in the Bronx, um, I'm here to say that if I can do this, so can anyone in this room. If Villanova can knock off the kind of teams and runs that they've had, now I'm not gonna say anything about the four point play, I don't know what happened there, but that was definitely a knucklehead move, so sorry about that guy. But in 85, amazing, one of our J.D. Trey writes done a great job. And it's important for me when I do these things, and I do teach at Stanford and Duke and uh, the Naval Postgraduate School, I'll be in Babson next week, and I've been doing this for about 19 years. And why I love to come on campus is I just get this kind of, uh, this fresh air, this sense of intellectual capital, this think tank, and great minds are here doing great things. So I love to come back, but my biggest message to all of you is that you're probably afraid that when you get out there's no jobs, or it's not the job you like, or you're not gonna get paid, you're not gonna be passionate about what you do. And I'm here to say that when I've done anything in my career, I've never done it before. So I never published a book before and built a quarter billion dollar company, took it public, sold it. Um, then I went to publish newspapers, a Hollywood Reporter in Hollywood, I never did that before. I published a music magazine, uh, Billboard, never done that before. And it, I think there's kind of a secret, you know, kind of ingredients and elements. So loosely titled, we're gonna talk about innovation, we're gonna talk about creativity, we're gonna talk about entrepreneurship. We're gonna talk about ICE. Is that a familiar concept around here? ICE? Okay, so it's a good concept. And I just had lunch with Patrick, and I, and I really wanna believe that if you have entrepreneurial DNA, you can be a nurse, you can be undergraduate, you can be a communications major, but you need to really understand why entrepreneurs, why change agents, why Steve Jobs, who's the chief innovation officer of Apple, why is it that he could be the CEO of Pixar and Apple, two amazingly innovative companies, uh, do it at the same time, that there's a certain kind of DNA, there's a certain kind of consistency to people's mindset now, so we'll talk about that. Uh, so first I wanna talk about <laughs> this little notion called dummies. And dummies, it was an innovative concept, it was a brand. Most books, authors, publishers, really published by the title. And I had a concept that I think people are smart, but they're being made to feel dumb. And that's called, in Madison Avenue, that's called a psychographic, right? So you've got this feeling you're smart, you're being made to feel dumb by the jargon and by all the, the secret handshake, all the lingo. And having gotten out of school, dating myself in 1981, when the PC was first introduced, 
that always stuck with me. It's like, I'm trying to learn computers, I'm selling software, I'm selling books. Um, my first job was as a traveling salesman for Prentice Hall, selling college textbooks to professors. How many professors in this room? You guys drove me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be, I'd be in Vermont and New Hampshire and Massachusetts and Rhode Island, and who was behind me every time I was giving a sample to a professor was the used book guy. So I'd be given the first, oh, you're nodding your head. Oh, you're doing it, clutching. And what I do is I give a sample and say, here's our new introduction to management or accounting or, or psychology. And the guy behind me said, hey, how much will you take for that book? Would take five or $10? And I couldn't believe it. Yeah, you're, you're not too. It happens, right? So that was my first experience in, in publishing and in, in, in education. I said, there's got to be a better way, like sampling books and figuring out how to get adoption. So I always felt that the notion of a brand is a pretty important place to start. So one of the things I do is I try to work with the kind of ordinary people possible. So I'm actually a senior lecturer I'm in the Department of Defense for the Naval Postgraduate School. And uh, if you think it's a group least likely to innovate, you got it, okay? The military. Regimented rules, regulations, um, uniform dress, procedures, uh, don't step outside of the line, incredibly unwilling to think in any way but how you're programmed to think. So they brought me in to kind of help think through where the Navy's been the, uh, identified as a military strategist. They're an engineering DNA. And they want to take that engineering DNA to more of a B-school entrepreneurial DNA. Really think through this, this new, faceless, silent, cell, mobile enemy, all the conflict we have around the world. And it's really interesting to, to spend my time with these folks. And I had one person on one side of the room, a commanding officer, said, innovation, entrepreneurship, I don't want anybody to think until they're 31. I want to cram their brain down the way I want them to think, and they're going to toe the line. And then I had another peer of his saying, you have to be kidding me. This is the leadership in our Navy where you don't want anyone young to think. So I stopped my talk and then just battled it out for about half an hour. And I said, you know, what is like Mark Zuckerberg, Jerry Gang, David Philo, Bill Gates? And I went on for like five minutes. What do they all have in common? Any guess? Oh, my boys from rugby. Who are my rugby boys? Anybody from going to a rugby practice tonight? Raise your hand. I know you're gone. What do you think they have in common? I gave you the answer five seconds ago. Play How old are they? <laughs> they're all young, right? So they're in their 20s. So here's a leader that wants to stamp out that thinking that your age defines your intellectual capital, your innovative potential. And here's another colleague saying we can't think that way. So I spent about four years with the Navy, and I'm still alive and well to talk about it. So here's some of the covers. When I was thinking about publishing a dummies book, I'm saying, OK, how can I help these people and think really rigidly so Lean Six Sigma, anyone know what Six Sigma is? Any concept? Oh, it's, a, it's a thing that was started by Jack Welsh from GE, who uh, basically it's a management technique where you focus on the, the goals and the customers. Right, process improvement, you get black belt. So, so here's how the Navy and the Army interpreted it for me. They said, show us some savings, we'll take the credit. And that's how people in the higher head office, the commanding officers, took a look at all the minions doing the work, and we'll take the credit. So this is how they said, you know, we just don't think right. And then with HQ, headquarters, right, management, um, dealing with headquarters where might makes right, using muscle rather than analysis and planning. So this is how the Army, the Navy, is telling me how they have stupid, dumb stuff going on in their world. So you're not alone when you think about what's going on. Here's a, a, a actually, a photograph they gave to me. Check out the weapons, right? Here's Captain Kelly, right, practicing weapon safety, right? Look where the guns are pointing. <laughs> weapon safety. At each other, right? <laughs> Not really the brightest <laughs> tools in this shed. And then, as you know, this is probably your dorm, but if it's not your dorm, you're the most military uh, officer has to keep everything tight and clean. This is what's called, you know, junk in the bunk, right? And this is a barracks out. So, this is how the ability to have some humor with your ecosystem, your environment, and the fact that working with a, in, an organization that is so immune to change and so immune to think. We're really having some fun trying to talk a little bit about Villanova. So when I came on campus the last night this morning, I said, okay, what covers can we do that might speak to the Villanova community? What's dumb? Maybe what's not as intuitively logical? So here's low cholesterol for dummies. I checked out this place called the Corner Grill. You know, yeah. cheap, cheap, cheap Philly cheesesteaks. They got a lot of really low cholesterol items on the menu. <laughs> and and who, who wants carrots anyway, right? So that might be kind of an innovative way to get to the corner grill folks and say, come on, you know, we can do a little better. And then, of course, late night, we got the munchies. 
maybe you've been doing a few things that might warrant the munchies. <laughs> and of course, it's the winger delivery guys, right? And so they're quite always punctual, aren't they? And by the way, no one ever took anyone else's order, ever, when they when arrived. So I think there's probably some lessons learned about how the dummies approach bite work at Villanova. And then, of course, there's another cool place I discovered called the spit. And that's really, you know, how to make monotony tasty. And, uh, a really cool place to hang. By the way, I just got the president's report. And there was like three pages on the whole sustenance and maintenance and organic food. Is it not hitting the spit? In the <laughs> You're just trying to brainwash your parents. Is that how it works? Okay. And then, of course, what is this? You know, you know, dummies guys like me, we hate acronyms, right? So what is this MP stuff? Meal Plan Express. Like, does anyone know when you use them and when the schedule works? Is that really intuitive? Well, tell me about that. What is it? Um, you, depending on the meal plan you have, some people can use up to two per day. Well, my meal plan is the 19 meal plan. I can use up to two per meal period. But then if I run out of meals, I'm done with it. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the schedule makes no sense, and, you know, listen, you got to have some fun with this stuff called innovation. So, no disrespect to any of our finest faculty in the room, but there's been some discussion offline about sociology and philosophy, and there's such a riveting, engaging, absolutely amazing edge of your seat experience when you go to the classroom. <laughs> And so maybe the feedback is from your constituency is that it spice up those required classes, okay? So no disrespect, but here's a couple of thoughts about if you're going to do 200 million dummies books, which will be the number in November, the 20th anniversary, um, the Villanova administration really needs to really say thanks to the mainline taxi group and the on-campus frat row that this is what, this is called a moist campus, right? So one geographical section is dry and the other geographical section is moist. You can have like 24 cans and no more. Like who's counting? Like how does that work? So, you know, when you do those campus parties, you're taking the long way home and hope to tag. By the way, um, I took a taxi last night. It took 45 minutes for a pickup at a local pizza joint. So Mainline's not doing a really fine job of being prompt. So, a couple of thoughts, and I gotta tell you, um, it's a tough crowd, but come on. <laughs> what's up with that? Villanova, no fun of Vanilla Nova, what, what's with that brand? <laughs> and of course, it's by your local RA, and it's also by public safety, and it's the best way to sneak past the front desk when you're a couple of beers deep. <laughs> Never happened to anyone in this room, right? <laughs> so, what have we learned? We learned that if you want to be different, you've got to get some humor. You want to think different, you've got to think in the minds of your customers. So when I walked around Villanova, and by the way, there were students in the room that actually did these for me. They designed the covers, and they actually wrote, well, there, stand up. The, uh, oh, you don't want to stand up. Oh, you don't want to, no, it'd be recognized. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so, um, I started with saying a couple things. A, um, it's really important for me personally to come here is to make sure everyone gets the mishigash. Anyone know Yiddish? The mishigash, the gunk, the stuff in your head that says, I can't do it. It won't work. Listening to naysayers, I had everybody tell me this was a stupid idea. It would never work. In fact, the company I work with, and I talk about this notion called entrepreneurship, I work for three multi-billion dollar multinational companies. A German company, Bertelsmann, a Dutch company, BNU. And you know the, the Germans and the Dutch, right? They're never precise about figures or attendance or being on time. Never, never, never. And then an American company, IDG. And what I learned in my thesis from hell is how to innovate within a slow, stodgy, lack of innovative, no digital, mobile, speed DNA. How do you do that? And you know, you basically got to follow your gut. You got to have some guts. You have to have some courage. You have to listen to the beat of a different drummer. You have to take the path less traveled. You can't be a cookie cutter. You don't get the prescription from some book. You're not going to follow Richard Branson's path. You're probably not going to follow any other job's path. They're all different. They all speak and run and beat to a different drummer. And I'll tell you why. I'm in uh, San Francisco. I meet this 24-year-old. And he says, come on in. I want, I want you to help me think through something. His name is Sean Conway. He's a student, had uh, ADHD. He's in class, and he can't multi-process. He can't listen to the professor and take notes. So he says, I've got to figure out a way 
And the big thing about innovation is find the pain and conquer and cure the pain. Very simple prescription. Find the pain. Dummies, you're smart for being made to feel dumb. Technology is not intuitive, it's weird. I I've got pain, right? So he creates a company called Noteball.com. What does he do? He has his students do the study guide to the course in their own words, interpreting the lecture as they deem fit. He pays them a small stipend, they get a royalty on the back end, and he's created in everybody who's doing an entrepreneur. I can actually monetize my experience while I'm in school and help other people like me. Since I bought Cliff Notes from Cliff, I can say, amplify their learning. You know, my, at Cliff Notes, on Sunday night at 11 p.m., the number one download time for Cliff Notes. All right? We were the number one keyword at Yahoo when I bought the company. And so you're going to have that pain, right? I live a socially adventurous lifestyle. I want to amplify my learning. I'm going to go on Notable and download. And then you have this eBay ecosystem of buying and selling study guides. And you can see how that might spiral. So here's a business that's on a seven digit run rate from a person who has some pain about digesting information. And he had the courage of his convictions. I call it the carpe diem spirit. What does that mean? Dead poet society? Seize the day. Seize the day, right? How many times you have an idea and people say it'll never work? And what do you do? You file it. You believe them. I'm telling you, don't do that. that. That's absolutely the death knell of any sort of instinctive, entrepreneurial, innovative thinking. So, it's not fun to be, you know, having USA Today editors put a dunce cap on me or having People Magazine have me in a, uh, a kitchen. Um, but what was interesting is, is what their interpretation is that the, the populist identification with the underdog, a lot of people feel left out. Left out of the financial revolution, left out of the technology revolution, they feel left out. That's a psychographic, that's an emotional feeling. And I always identify with that feeling. And if you go champion that cause, great things can happen. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, people like you. Grew up in the Bronx, immigrant son, one of 10 people in a three bedroom apartment with one toilet. And let me tell you, as a kid, as a boy, you never watched TV, you never used the bathroom, you definitely took out the garbage, and you had a long line if you wanted to get any food at, at argument table. So, I was a buddy entrepreneur. You see me with my little bow tie and my little, uh, my little tweed jacket, Easter Sunday. And um, I, unlike you, I went to a Jesuit uh, St. Ignatius school, probably those crazy Jesuits, those, uh, those enlightened scholarly Jesuits. But between the Augustinian values, I think, and the Jesuit uh, Ignatius values is the notion of service. Right? Well, I do like to work with military. What do they do for us? They serve our country. What do we learn in, in, in a St. Augustinian culture? Sir, ethical thinking, critical thinking, moral-based foundation. So um, I learned that early on with my Roman Catholic Irish parents and as an altar boy. And let me tell you, getting up, thank God they changed from Latin to English <coughs> to my story. Because I was on the cusp of having to learn Latin, which would have helped my vocabulary. But I did all that at Ford. I'm sorry, it's not Villanova. And then going from the Bronx to Silicon Valley was kind of a big leap for me. It's like, I'm going to leave my natural home state of New York City to go to Silicon Valley. I wanted to start up a business. I had an instinct to leave corporate America. So going to Silicon Valley was very much you know, kind of my dream. Um, in fact, that lunch today with Patrick and Patty and Madonna, we just talked about, boy, if the Villanova <coughs> School brand can get a footprint in Silicon Valley and even get your brand known and get some companies in here. So I was at Facebook last week. And you know what they do for innovation in Facebook? They have these black and white signs. And one of the signs is, run real fast and break things. Another sign when you walk by is, are we a technology company? Question mark. Another message and sign, and these are just black and white printout. This is not like an, an epitaph of big photos and inspirational you know, visuals. This is just black and white type. The next one was, uh, or, uh, done is better than perfect. Okay? <coughs> So three messages I just committed to memory because it was amazing to me to see um, no one has an office. Well, Mark has an office. They call it the fish tank. He's in a glass kind of conference room. Everyone else has a laptop and a cube. Okay, so when you think about entitlements, corner office, forget about that. Look at the most innovative companies. I had a meeting with Mayor Bloomberg and we talked about you know, Bloomberg Media, not his mayoral campaign. And he said, so what about culture? What does it mean to you? He says, John, I sit in the pit. I don't have an office. I sit in the center of gravity of my newsroom so everyone can see my culture and that I listen to ideas. I'm not, I don't have the trappings of success. If I want to take a private phone call, I'll go to a conference room. No office. I was asked to go to see Jeff Bezos as we start Amazon. A board member and I worked together. Patty sent me up there and we talked about everything he wanted to do. He said, John, you know, I want to do something special. 
I want to really redefine e-commerce. And books, the bookstore's closed, the library's closed. I want to be open. There's limited inventory. I want to have endless inventory. And I want to do that really, really well online. And let me tell you something. All the desks, I build them with my dad. I go to Home Depot. I buy the wood. I buy the brackets. And we build a desk. And the message I'm sending my people, I'm willing to do it. So should you. Okay, so just a mention about when you're thinking about, I want to get that corner office, I want to get my cool space when I get out of college. That's not what innovation is about. Innovation is listening. And how do we define listening? As waiting to talk, right? Teachers, anyone there? Parents, anyone here? Kids? You've got to listen actively because when I heard, hey, I'm frustrated, I want to book on DOS, you know, Microsoft DOS, you know, DOS for dummies. Do you have anything? for me, a dummy like me. I heard that 87 launched a company in 1990, and down to my last $200,000 with a whopping 1.5 million in seed capital, I was desperate. So innovation was born out of desperation. It wasn't born out of strategy. And innovation was born out of listening and keeping that thought in my head, and four years later, having the guts to print a whopping 7,500 copies. So I had a lot of confidence in the title, and, and let it take off, and it did, and it went crazy. So. The one thing I believe that Silicon Valley, and I did implore you know, uh, your team here, is that it's really important, it's in the ether there. And I had never published a book before, and one thing about innovation, it's a rocket ship. Okay, it's your seatbelts. You've got to be able to embrace change, you have to be open-minded, you have to be able to identify your weaknesses and be cool with it. Um, three weeks I moved to Silicon Valley, I was promoted from head of sales and marketing to owning the P&L, and then a year later I was made CEO. I was every single time like, holy crap, are these guys crazy? <laughs> they must be nuts making me running anything. Nuts, wacko jobs. And that was absolutely the trajectory of just hang in there, you know, just deal with every crazy nut coming away. They say when you're going through hell, keep going. I had nothing about a PL. I did I was a communications major at Fordham. You know, I didn't have any sense of a balance sheet. I had no sense of inventory management. No whatsoever. Follow your gut. And do one thing is stay close to your team and stay close to the marketplace. Get out of your office and go hang out where things happen. So I did a simple thing. I had a little envelope and I wrote down kind of my revolution <coughs> was to revolutionize learning. Um, fancy myself an education entrepreneur. I really wanted to figure out why my, my Irish father would always say, why can't you fight, solve the Irish problem? Come on, Johnny. Why don't, why don't you do right your congressman? Why don't you? Little did I know he was probably giving money to the IRA and running guns. But you know, at the same time, uh, you know, that was his way of solving the problem. My, you know, he was, he was challenging me intellectually to say, why can't you solve a problem? Why can't you take a stand? So my revolution was, hey, I'm smart, being made to feel dumb. I'm sure there's other people like me. Had no focus groups. Had nobody validating the concept. In fact, at, at IBG, a multi-billion dollar company, magazine, venture capital, training, newspapers. Everything they do is paid for by advertising or contractual obligations. They say, don't you dare. The editors in chief said, don't you dare do that to us. You're going to destroy our brand image. You're going to hurt our ESOP, our employee stock option program. Do not do that. And you have what's called corporate saboteurs. Any idea of what, who those folks might be? These are people that constantly naysay. They constantly want to cut you down. Do you, you hang out with friends like that? If you do, don't tonight. All right? Because that, that, that negative, trash-talking, <laughs> saboteurism happens all the time. I, I consult to Siemens, Microsoft, um, Sodexo, um, and, and they call silo thinking. There are people that just will not deal with an idea unless they invent it. You know, not invented here syndrome. You've got to really have the courage to say, hey, I believe in this. And what I said as a sales guy is, I want to acquire what sells instead of sell what acquires. I came from the sales. I come in from a whole sales marketing trench warfare perspective. And I was always upset. When I went into a room at Bertelsmann's, which is now Random House Bertelsmann, we have 96 people in the room. And you know who took all the credit when the book works? Guess. Guess what function in a publishing process? You have the salesperson, you have the CEO, you have the editor, you have the author. Who do you think in the publishing company took all the success of the book works? Starts with an E, and it's not an entrepreneur. Editor, right? Editor acquired the book, had the vision, it worked. Now, when the book didn't work, who got all the blame? Sales. Sales, why? You sold too much. You put it in the wrong place in the store. You didn't do a promotion. You know, the book's didn't get out of the cart. It was unbelievable. So that little experience, feeling really upset and really ticked off and said, you've got to be kidding me. You mean the elite editor, the PhD in comparative literature, has the omnipotence, knowledge, insight, foresight, 
And Orwellian you know, revisionist history say, hey, it was all about me. And I said, whatever we do, we're going to create a culture. And the one thing we learn about innovative cultures is don't drop the U-R-E off the word. Because what happens when you do that? What do you get? Okay. I know I feel like a teacher, right? But sometimes things go, you know, it's like 3 o'clock and the blood hits the stomach. Or they have a couple of pints and hit the bloodstream. How are you two guys? I'm watching you. I'm an Irishman from Dublin. Okay. So what happens? It's a cult. It's a fiefdom. That's not an innovative culture, okay? What happens when people go like this? What are they saying to you, paraverbal? Okay. I'm not listening. I'm not open to what you have to say. I'm closed-minded. That one leadership cue in an innovative culture is killing and damning. All right? And I, I, I operate under a principle of silence is anything but consent. <coughs> what does that mean to you? Silence is anything but consent. They don't, they don't believe it. They don't believe. They are unwilling to speak out. The culture's probably got a retribution, reprimand, you know, bad corporate citizen. And what happens? Some of your best ideas never get the light of day. <coughs> the leader is very much managing by fiat, managing by dictatorial control. And, and they say in Eastern Europe, then people vote with their feet. What do they do? They leave. They move on. And that's why I left New York City Publishing. That's why I'm involved with two startups that are out to basically disintermediate publishers. Don't believe me anymore. Because at Fast Pencil, we can provide you the tools, the ecosystem, the crowdsourcing, and the print on demand, and all the facilities under the market strategy to do books. You don't need an editor or a publisher and, and a logo to publish, right? Um, so it's an interesting marketplace, and in nine months, this company's position to be sold because people realize, wow, you can actually arm the masses to publish, and they don't need to get a publishing contract. Pretty impressive. So, that was one of the ideas. The next thing is innovation is you have to have this notion of the TMBT, the next big thing. You've got to be in constant pursuit, reading articles, listening to the radio. When you're traveling, pick up the local newspaper. There's one thing when I had lunch with the guy, he said, when I travel, I read the local news. And I really want to see and keep my finger on the pulse of what's happening at demand, what's happening with labor, what's happening with just crazy ideas. Really, really important that you just don't get obsessively fixated with Yahoo News or Jon Stewart or MTV or Comedy Central, or Funny You Die. Uh, if you want to be in the comedy world, that's great. But keep an open mind on how people experience different trends and different. So Japan, what do you think? Is that a crisis or an opportunity in Japan? No disrespect to what's happening there at all, OK? But you know, there are people saying, wow, you know, real estate's going to go crazy. There's going to be new inventions, new innovations happening about radiation that people are looking at the opportunity to solve, prevent, <coughs> attack, curtail the problem as opposed to saying, oh my god, what a disaster. You know, again, carpe diem. Take some action. Think about how you can solve problems. Um, David Ogilvy wrote a great book, Confessions of an Ad Man, High or Chief Weakness. What does that mean? What does it mean to you? What does it, what does it say? What do they say you never interview? Never admit your weakness. Never at all discuss. In a leadership environment, in an innovative culture, you've got to say, listen, I am not the best financial genius in the world. I need somebody to crunch the numbers. <coughs> I'm not an R&D person. I need someone to jump on and look at the whole R&D implications. You've really got to be open-minded and open about where you're just not strong. Most leaders don't want to do that. Most leaders don't get those innovative cultures because people are afraid. They think, guess what's happening? The leader has all the ideas. The leader has all the answers. And what? guess what? The leader doesn't. The leader's you know, probably hoping they do, but they don't. So it's really important. To really admit your weaknesses, it's really important to be in a culture of um, risk taking. Um, a big D for me is dare to be different. If I leave you with one thought, is dare to be different. I'm not saying drink 17 shots tonight. All right? <laughs> That's not cool. That may not even be different, which is you know, really worse. <laughs> but the notion is you know, you've got to think through is like, I have a differential point of view than anyone else. All right, boys. Thank you. Thank you. Ask for my name, you'll get a better seat. All right. So, you know, it's really important that you really think through that part of your world. Is why do people always want to do the same thing? It's okay if you want to go to a big six, big four accounting firm. It's okay if you want to work for a Fortune 500 company. It's okay. But people like me are asked to come into Fortune 500 companies to innovate. Help us think differently. Help us to get out of our bureaucracy. Help us to get out of our routine and our emotions. Help us to have ideas that are probably not as popular. So you need to be embracing that. Um, everything has a metric. That, you know, 
Mel Welch mentioned you can't manage what you can't measure, but in my case, I had a simple vision. I was a sales guy. Increase gross margin return on investment. If I could increase inventory returns for all my customers, I came more Walmart, Barnes & Noble, I thought I probably had a great business. And, and that was really a compelling thing. So the sales guy, if, you, if your SKUs don't turn, you're going to get them all sent back. So that was a simple measure. Um, I like the Nancy Reagan School of Negotiation, just say no. When you're a entrepreneur or innovator, you typically have scarce resources, right? So I always tell my people, just say no and have fun, okay? It's really important to have fun. Why is it important to have fun in an innovative environment? Has anyone heard of IDEO from Palo Alto? Okay, design shop invents a lot of, designs and invents a lot of amazing things. They have, you know, um, wings of airplanes in their offices. They have people at bicycles. They go around, like I was on Facebook last week, people are on uh, scooters. You have to have a playful environment in which to liberate your ideas, okay? Really important. You can't go into a cookie cutter, robotic cubicle and say, Wow, what an interesting environment. It doesn't mean they, they can't be. What I'm suggesting is be different and create an environment where you want to have create ideas to learn. Um, by the way, if you have questions, just jump out. Um, I'll tell you a quick one about Lee. I had lunch with Lee Icoke, we're launching his new book. And I said, Lee, tell me what was the most important book you've ever read or the most defining thing in your life. And he says, I'll tell you really quickly what it was. I hired a guy named Bob McNamara. Anyone know who Bob McNamara was? Recently passed away. The, the, uh, Harvard Business School, Department of uh, Defense, right? Secretary, Secretary of Defense. He, uh, there's an executive that dies on the job of crisis. They're turning around the company. They're really invented. Executive dies on the job at 9.30. Leaves behind two kids. Very popular executive. Um, Lee says to Bob, Bob, this is crazy. Our culture is people dying on the job. You've got to really address that. Bob McNamara, Navy man, Harvard B School. Um, goes back to his typewriter at the time. Probably maybe a Wangworth processor. And he says, you know, to Christ the worldwide staff, um, sorry to mourn the passing of a very valued executive. Uh, next paragraph. Effective immediately, comma, no one's allowed to work past 9.30 at night. So that was a chief administrative officer's interpretation of an executive passing. Effective immediately, comma, no one's allowed to work past 9.30 at night. What, what do you think? So Iacocca goes nuts and says, you've got to be kidding me. That's our culture? to dictate the, the terms of work so people don't have heart attack and not tackle the stress that we're putting them under, that maybe it's up to us. You know, in China they say, if the student fails, don't shoot the student, shoot the teacher. How do you like that? Like that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so at least like the, John, that was the most defining thing in my life, to have someone with such great academic, professional, military, political um, strength to interpret that crisis like that. Um, so really important that you know you think long and hard about that message. Another message here is that scarcity, right? Down to my last twenty thousand dollars. Scarcity, not abundance, is what drives innovation. Does that mean anything, to anyone? Why does someone who's got seventeen credit cards maxed out, the loans being called in thirty days, what happens to the quotient of innovation in those thirty days? Goes up dramatically. Why? Bingo, right? So there's stress, oh my god, right? There's, there's distress, fight or flight, and then there's eustress. And that's what you want in an innovative culture. It's the why people run marathons. What do you get? It begins with an E again, hang in there. When you run a marathon, what do you get? Endorphins. Endorphins. What do endorphins do? Natural painkillers. Make you feel really, the adrenaline's run. That's the eustress you want, right? You want to have an environment. Like, oh my god, I told a team, hey, I'm not going back to the Bronx and embarrassing myself in front of my friends. Like, we're gonna figure something out, and if you don't, I will. And 200,000 bucks for a global media company ain't a lot, folks. And Dots for Dummies came out of that moment in time where I said, okay, I gotta do something different. I gotta dare to be different, I gotta take a shot. And that's how that book was born. Not out of strategy, out of desperation. So think about that. What happens when desperation happens? Remember I said, when you're going through hell? Keep going, keep going right? No pain. No game, right? You know, it's simple stuff, but people run away from the pain. <coughs> people run away. I'm telling you, embrace it and make it work for you, right? So scarcity, not abundance, is a big part of the innovation culture. And I'm sorry to say, separate that bird. I did have these circular glasses and the spiked hair. But, you know, that character was pretty much to identify with everybody that feels ticked off about something, right? Um, 
<laughs> My report card is an F right now. <laughs> so, um, I was saying just about that funny audio thing do up there. So, you know, that whole new series, Dummies Books of the Rescue, I identify with important people. And you guys think about not designing a product, not creating services. How do I help people? Right? What's our Augustinian? Ignatian values, service, service, help people. I wanted to help people figure out this nonsense. And you know, at the end of the day, I was always about like, how do I get a book on the New York Times bestsellers? It took me a decade we got there. And then these two books and movies really struck for me as, as a message, right? So say, how am I gonna get people to create some currency, some money so that we can pay the lights, right? And it was all the president's men, famous line by the then code name Deep Throat. Say it again? Follow. Follow the money. I told all my team, you figure out where the budgets are, figure out what people are buying, get close to the money trail, and good things are going to happen. Jerry McGuire, of course, show me the money. money. Let's bring some PO. So I went to the largest bookstore chain in America, Walden Books. CEO out selling. And I went there and I said, I've got to go to Dawson Dummies now. It's six months late to market. Dawson <coughs> Dummies. So I'm late to market. Technology got to be speed to market. Um, cover's kind of yellow, kind of like, you know, the title may be a little offensive. And I was going for the big PR. I'm going to show my team. I'm going to get the money. I'm going to file that money. I'm going to go right to Stanford, Connecticut. And the buyer spent about three seconds looking at it. He said, let me see. An ugly old cover. Insulting my customer. That would probably be returned. You want to know where I got two orders? Get out and stay out. Right? <laughs> True story. And it's like, oh my god. Like My heart sunk to my, my ankle and said, this guy hates it, but I still believe. So I went door to door, customer by customer, great things happen. So, Remember, Steve Jobs might be the chief innovation officer, but every CEO should be the chief encouragement officer, <coughs> encourage people to really aspire to greatness, and the chief evangelist. Get out in the market and make things happen, okay? Not the chief executive, that's just the title, that's the trapping. So, pain, really important. You have one concept of innovation, is find the pain points in any market, <coughs> find the gaps, figure out a way to remedy that, that pain, and here's what I saw in the market in terms of pain that was happening around 1989, <laughs> 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 Has anyone experienced that ever? <laughs> so pain, literal figures of pain there for sure. But that's what innovation is about, right? It's trying to figure out, hey, don't forget where Steve Jobs was, right? Bill Gates had to make an investment in Apple, right? Embarrassing Mac World Expo, a show that we owned at the time at IEG, 200 million. Apple was getting rocked, right? 5% of the market, best, no footprint in consumer electronics. What happened? What happened to Sony Walker? What happened to Microsoft, who's now the innovative king, queen of consumer electronics, gadgets, tech? So you can start, like I did, with you know, down to 200,000, getting your butts clean, your clock clean. You've got to figure out what are you learning and have that carpet you spirit to make them. That's pain there, and I knew I could help remedy and solve that pain. Because if you remember books at the time, they were about Manhattan phone books. They were big tomes and big blocks. So you can look at this right now and say, every time I leave a class, that's what I always say. And eh, rotten advice in that prof. Kerr said, I don't want to go back to the tunnels. But people who are innovators, they look at those letters and they rethink them and they say, ah, what could come out? They would have a wildest guess if you rearrange, what's it called? An anagram. What is it? An anagram. So if you were always sitting here, you're upset at your teacher, and I always hated when you say, what grade did you give me? What did I earn? See the difference? What grade did you give me in title? What did I earn? Big difference, okay? And that's what you want to breed in, in every interview you go on, when you're going for a job, in every environment that you're in. What did I earn versus what did you give me? So anybody have a shot at this one? Come on, somebody. 100 bucks. Oh. <laughs> a lot of beer. 100 bucks. <laughs> Go, you go, oh, 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 my brother, who's been taking <laughs> Dude, man, you got the 
tie and everything. <laughs> You're close. You are so damn close. And by the way, no one's ever gotten this, ever. I've been doing this for years. Say it again. So, say again. Creative entrepreneur. Oh, you're so damn Creative close, innovation. dude. What was it? Creative innovation. Turn innovation around. Innovator. No, just the opposite of innovation. It's, it's uh, hang with me for a second, but it's actually innovation, but it's the opposite concept. $100. Creative destruction. Who said that? Dude, with the tie, this, you know, I say tie will strangle creativity. Well, let me tell you, the two guys with the ties, well done. <laughs> consistent connection with the heart and mind of a prospect or a customer that will always feel good about your brand. You know how many people put their, their, their actual logo on their bicep? There's more lawyers that have bikes than actually Hell's Angels, right? So how does a lawyer put a brand? So think about branding in that way. How can I create something sustainable, scalable, that's emotionally connected, right? So McDonald's, you always know the kids are going to have fun, there's going to be a happy meal, right? Hess gas stations have clean gas bathrooms typically. Um, you know, you, there's some consistent, you know, if I buy something from Nike, the competitive spirit's there. Um, Disney, if I watch a movie, Wholesome Entertainment. You, know, you kind of get a sense of what the brand DNA is. So, brand is really important, and that's what worked for me, to scale this data. We scaled it, we got up to a quarter billion, bought cliff notes, bought front was travel. And the key message is, it's just six keywords in branding. Define the market to your advantage. Just really simple. Define the market to your advantage. And that's what we did with Dummies. We just defined it simply as a market. It's scale. We did technology and everyone said, don't do anything but technology. And I said, hey, people don't know how to figure out their taxes. We're publishing quick and for dummies. So I said, let's do personal finance. Then we said, hey, what about music? So we did Beethoven for dummies. Dum, 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 dum. And now there's slot machines in Vegas. There's lotteries in Florida. So you've got to imagine a different world. Then I said, hey, let's bring other partners in. So when we did, when the NHL came to me and said, we want more women to go to hockey games, we did hockey for dummies. We did with Berlitz, um, Italian for dummies. And then abroad was really tough. Um, so we went and did the World Cup thing. And we were in England, and we went to London, and we just kind of, we walked the talk of that local environment. It took us four years to get into Asia. Why? We don't insult people in that culture. Uh, so it took four years. We, we launched the first book in China. It was Ding and Don Learn. So I let them, you know, I, I let them do it. But then in France, it was Quasi Newell for zeros. And they published Sex Quasi Newell. And they actually, because you know, you're an entrepreneur, so you got to let your local publisher with local taste. So they packaged the condom in the back with an arrow this way up. Um, <laughs> true story. And then if you really get good, then all of a sudden the Wall Street Journal starts scooping on you, and that's really good, right? So there's so many dummies books, are there any other books? And this one thing about the letters, that quick and for dummies, um, I put a read response card in every book, and I read them. And I read them by the buckets, and that's where personal fans came from. The whole reason to get out of technology were customers expressing frustration. You're helping me input data in a cell in Quicken. Help me manage my money. Bam. By the way, most authors never wrote a book before. I told them, this is what I want. I want a funny, comedic, David Letterman, top 10. 
icons, bombs bursting, jokes, cartoons, help disarm people who really feel terrified and make it work. So that's how that happened. Dr. Ruth, <coughs> she's this tall. <laughs> and I know because when I stand next to her photos, I gotta do this. She lives in Washington Heights, in a Dominican, really bad neighborhood. She will probably tell you she lost her virginity in Israel. She lost her entire family in Germany during World War II. She speaks fluent French, so I sent her, and she says, Ah, oh, look, John, we, we made a baby! <laughs> With the little miniature books. And guess what her job was in the military in the Israeli army? Take a guess. Wild guess. She was actually in the Israeli army. Sniper. <laughs> True story. By the way, has anyone read or purchased Sex for Dummies? <laughs> Only once in my entire career when I've asked that question has some dude admitted it. <laughs> and, and the dude goes, Harley, pick me, pick me up. Whoa, we got a problem here. What? He goes, I bought it for my wife. <laughs> that was his proud you know, revelation. He bought it for his wife. So, uh, Here's a little bit, and I'm going to move fast because I really want to get you uh, out partying, and I know everybody wants to be doing that. Here's when you really get it going, even Regis starts There's one page in here that Dr. Ruth specifically wrote for me. <laughs> and I, it, I'm sure it's dedicated to me, but it says right here, I'm too old to have sex. No! <laughs> You're never too old, Regis. You're never too You're, old. Human beings find that many of their fa uh, faculties grow weaker. <laughs> any of the faculty? The faculty? <laughs> None that so many people gave up on as easily on, as sense. That's a rude, that's a long sentence. <laughs> <laughs> if your eyesight gets, gets weaker, yeah, that too. Uh, do you go around squinting all the time? You <laughs> run to an eye doctor. Exactly what I did. <laughs> so, so just a, a little, you know, humor is good, you're laughing. That's what happens when people laugh. It's disarming. When people get disarmed, what do they do? They contribute. And if you're a great innovative leader, let people talk. Two big words to innovative brainstorming, <laughs> defer judgment. Okay? <clears throat> defer judgment. Really important. So many judgmental people in this world, you've got to let oxygen for ideas happen. Where's our rugby friends? Innovation is a team sport. Really important. It's not about one individual. It's a team. Um, quickly, anybody? What's going on here in this photo? What's innovative happening here? <laughs> Don't sell freaking toothpaste to, you know, toothless people. In it, right? <laughs> one size doesn't fit all. We, we did a lot of customized editions. We never looked at everybody as like a one size fits all. Really important. Trademarked everything. Everyone told me you couldn't trademark the title, couldn't trademark the colors. You can do it. And that's really important. If you have an idea, own it. Get a trademark. I talked about when you're going through hell, keep going. Really important that you spend time out of your world and think. Whether, and I love coming on campus, whether it's vacation, whether it's the beach, whether it's the library, think deeply about what's going on in your world. I talked about silence, it's anything about consent. Really important, don't be a really oppressive leader in an innovative culture. Um, I always say to the military, where is entrepreneurship best exemplified in the military? What environment? Quick guess. Bingo, well done. Why is it that you think quickly, you use your experience, but you follow your intuition, and you, the people who win the Entrepreneur of the Year get the Purple Heart? They do everything instinctive and smart and wise, and they learn, and <coughs> when they come back to DC, what happens? Rules, regulations, bureaucracy, follow the playbook. So they get it. When, when, when I tell them that, they get it. They understand that there's a, there's a world where you have to think quick. Money's tight, competition's rough, you've got to jump in the game. So another message is get a cause. Innovators are about taking a cause. This was just helping Paul McCartney, unfortunately. He's married at the time, and his wife was missing a leg. I'm not laughing about that. As soon as we raised the money, we cut the check, he divorced her. But you remember that, Heather, right? It was yeah. really terrible. So here I am, you know, Mass Square Garden, all right, Paul, you know, adopt the minefield, and then on the paper the next day, he divorces his wife, and the whole cause was, but thanks, Paul. <laughs> so yeah, have a cause. Be passionate about something, have a cause. It's not about getting a job. It's not about a pension. It's about being passionate about something. Um, 
I'm not going to show this. This is actually an interesting um, little piece of the Wounded Warriors and what we do in, in Queens, New York, about the uh, people coming back from the war. Um, but I will say, when I'm driving down 101 in Silicon Valley, I always see these city bank ads, and I'm in traffic, and I'm ticked off. And it's like, <clears throat> those who die with the most toys are still dead. And I'm like, I'm in traffic. Like, what? <laughs> and I go down another mile, I'm still in traffic. I'm getting closer to the Mountain View, and then it's like, um, your money doesn't hug you back. And I'm like, what's that all about? And it's a city bank ad. And what I took from that is, listen, if you're going for the salary, if you're going for the stock options, we said in my company, Silicon Valley, people rest and invest. When you give them stock options, it's a four-year investing period. You know what happens to innovation? <clears throat> Why? People want to fly under the radar and not jeopardize the value of their options. So actually, the opposite can be the case with, with going public is you actually decrease your innovation quotient because you've got what you got there, and now you want to monetize the experience. So make sure you always stay edgy, you stay hungry, you stay really honest for that, that next big thing, and it's not about the toys, it's not about the money, it's not about the traffic of success. So a couple of things, we're going to end this, take some questions. Dare to be different. It's okay to be the underdog. It's in fact great to be the underdog. It brings the fire and the passion to your team. More. People said this could never scale to sex and guitars and slot machines, always have the philosophy, ask one question, what more can I do for you? And that question alone will have a lot of inventiveness coming. Customers will say, well, wait, come to think of it, I think you can do this, this, and different for me. Bam, that's where innovation pops up. Get a mentor, be a mentor, really important. Whether it's a VC, private equity, a professor, grammar school teacher, uncle, friend, get somebody to bounce your ideas off of that's got the open-mindedness, the lack of ego and judgment, to hang with you, get an answer, and then it is all about you. That's what I said earlier. Not what did you give me, it's what did I earn, okay? Um, it's really important that if you blame anybody, blame yourself. Entrepreneurs, innovators, only blame themselves. They don't blame their team. They don't blame resources. They don't blame the budget. They don't blame the competition. They blame themselves. Einstein when asked, what would you do in an hour, the great mind that you are, to solve the greatest problem in the world? And his answer was, I spend 55 minutes on defining the problem. All right, really, really important. Think about how you shape your mind, how you think, who you surround yourselves with. And of course, if I was doing a book now, <laughs> I couldn't miss one. This plot must have been selling. I'd be on a torpedo tour with Charles winning. So thank you for your time. Again, on St. Patrick's Day, this Irish Irishman is very proud to be here. And if you take one thing away, you can't predict the future, invent it. Thank you.